Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. About a year ago, no, I'll st- I, I, I think I'll start with this. One of the first communications that Sandy ever made to me was this. And I kept it because it registered with me. He said, we come here to be nurtured into a relationship with our creator. We come here to be nurtured into a relationship with our creator. And I'll bet you there are some of you who don't have even a nodding acquaintance with that idea. Some of you probably have a nodding acquaintance with it, and you wish you didn't. And I'll bet you there are some of you who think you know all about God. I used to, and thought that you should think the way I did. When I started to think about what do I want to say about steps 10 and 11, I wrote at the top of the page, which I later scratched out, I have had no relationship with God for many years. I don't think that's true. See, I have a relationship with gravity. So do you, right now. I have a relationship with oxygen. I have a relationship with all of you. Some of you, a deep relationship, and some of you, I know you, I see you, but I don't have a really deep relationship with you. I have a relationship now with moving sidewalks. (laughs) And it seems to me that Bill had a lot to say about relationship. That word has become uppermost in my spiritual lexicon lately, relationship. He talks about the difficulties we have with relationship. And I think back to the days when Chuck Chamberlain tried to 12-step me, and he said, you think, he said, you think you're, that your problem is drinking alcohol. Yeah, he said, you've got problems with that. But he said, your real problem is you think you're separate from God. And there we have that idea of separate separation and dealing with relationship. In this big book, in step three, it says, self is the root of the problem. And when I think about my relationships, every time anything goes wrong in a relationship, it's always about self. And I think that what steps 10 and 11, particularly 11, is really about is what it says on page 164. See to it that your relationship with God is right, and then great things will come to pass. It doesn't say with the boss, with your lover, with your spouse, with whoever. It says, see to it that your relationship with God is right. I used to interpret that to mean, see to it that you're following the dictates, the dogmas, the prescriptions of a church. I don't think that's what it means. And over the last years, my relationship with God has changed drastically. And so I'm very happy to be here to share that with you. About a year ago, uh, I went to, I was invited to speak at a place called Waterdown, Ontario. And uh, I, a couple of the young ones from my group came with me. And after the meeting was finished, I said to them, you know, the convent in which I lived for 15 years is in this town. Would you like to see the building? And they said, oh, yes. Now, this is a huge building. It's built much like, it looks a bit like Buckingham Palace. So we drove out there, and it's now quarter to ten at night. And as we drove, I saw that the night watchman came to the door. And I was just going to drive away, and I thought, no, they might think somebody came to do some harm. So I got out of the car, and I went to the door, and I said, "Could uh, <clears throat> I said, we came not to do any harm. I said, I'm just showing these young people. I used to be a nun here, and um, I just came, brought them here so they could 
see where I was. He said, well, I'm sorry, I can't let you in, but he said, give me your name and I'll tell Mother Superior that you were here. Good enough. I walked back to the car, just a few steps, and by the time I got to the car, Anne was saying, there's somebody at the door, <clears throat> somebody at the door in a fuchsia suit waving us in. And so there, there was one of the sisters who had come by. And so we went in, and I said to her, <clears throat> I brought these young people, and I said, would it be all right with you? Could we possibly see the chapel? Oh, yes, she said, absolutely. I'll be happy. So she bustled off and put the lights on in the chapel, and I took these two young people up there. And <clears throat> I mention that because it was a real spiritual experience for me. I hadn't been up there for a long time, but it was a real experience of that was then, this is now. And as I stood there, I was reminded of the day I went there drunk as <clears throat> to enter the convent, and they took me, and how I stayed there for 15 years, drunk most of the time, and the experiences that I had there, and that that experience couldn't fix me. And who I am today, and I could understand that I had truly been transformed. And I came away from there after having a little conversation with this little lady in the fuchsia suit, because <clears throat> I, when we came downstairs, um, I thanked her profusely for letting us go up there, and um, she said, I don't want you to go yet. She said, I have something I want to say to you. I think she's probably about 90 years old. And um, she said, that AA that you belong to, she said, that's really something. I said, and how would you know that I belong to AA? And she said, I have a brother who's in AA, and he let me listen to one of your tapes. And she and she said, I want to thank you. I said, what for? She said, you spoke so kindly of the convent. And she said, we listened to your tape. And she said, we really appreciated it. I had nothing, no reason not to speak kindly of the convent. I had a great experience there. I mean, where wouldn't I have a great experience if I could be drunk all the time? I had a great experience there because uh, I had the privilege of meeting a lot of wonderful people. Uh, we had a wonderful library there, and wonderful scholars came by, and I got to spend time with them. There were wonderful people in the convent itself. I got a great education there, and above all, I got nourishment. And when I went into that chapel, I was overwhelmed with love and gratitude for my life, for everything that has happened. Because what I remembered was particularly the uh, organ. I became a musician at some point, and of all the things that I love, and of all the things that can make me feel holy, <laughs> it's listening to beautiful organ music. I love the organ music. I love the hymns. I love the especially some of the classical music. And so just being there just reminded me of that. I've lived most of my life in my head. Music takes me to the heart. And all the hours that I spent playing the organ in that beautiful chapel just washed right over me again. So there was that aspect of nourishment. So... I guess I'll just go on. I want to talk, I'm supposed to talk a little bit about step 10 uh, before I get to step 11. I think I shortchanged myself on step 10 because I, I don't know. I looked at it kind of as an inventory and I missed what it says. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. And I think that's really what the deal is. I have a daily reprieve, and if I'm going to continue to grow, remember Jim in uh, 
one of the people who's drunk is recorded in um, more about alcoholism, I think. He said he drank, he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. And so it says here, my next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. And you know what I have learned over the years is that, you know, we do steps one to nine. We learn those principles. We learn how it is that we are to be on the planet. And then <clears throat> we get to step 10. And now they put me out into the real world, and now I have to apply those. And you know what I remind? It's kind of like an apprenticeship. <clears throat> you know, you go to school, you become an apprentice, they teach you things, and then they send you out to apply it in the real world. I once took a course in conducting, and I remember the professor who taught us the various things that we had to know. And we all seemed to really know what we were doing, what we were talking about. And then the day came when he said, I'm bringing a group of students to, to the conservatory, and now you're going to conduct. And I can tell you that going from sitting in class, learning principles, to putting it into practice, that's where I started to grow as a conductor, in the, through the mistakes and through the experiences. And I think that's how I grow. I love the piece, too, where it says, I need to have a vision of God's will for me. And it says, I can use my will, exercise my willpower along this line, all that I wish. You know, I think some people don't know, or it came to me uh, that will is a good thing. It's a gift of God. If I didn't have the gift of will, then, then I'd be an amoeba, perhaps. I'd be this microphone, perhaps. But I have the gift of will. And it is that which gives me the capacity to make my choices. And I really believe that being able to make choices is a big deal. So, I also like the fact that Bill wrote on step 10 in this little book. And I'm not going to get into that whole thing, but I do want to say this. I've gotten a lot out of that because he talks in here about how practicing step 10 can lead us to emotional balance. And there are th three things he talks about in the 12 and 12 in step 10. And one is where he says it is a spiritual axiom that if I'm disturbed, I'm the one that's wrong. I love that. Didn't when I first read it. Love it now because it frees me from having to change you. I have it in my capacity to do the work so that I can change. I don't have to wait for you to do what I want. And then the, the second one that I like is he talks about the development of self-restraint. I'm going to tell you, I have never, ever been sorry for shutting my mouth and keeping it shut till I can think I have always regretted opening it. And the third thing he talks about is the examination of our motives. You know, I missed that for years. And I think of those three things that I really like from the 12 and 12 in Step 10. That business of examining motives has been a real gold mine for me. I sometimes think that I, my motives are pure as the driven snow. And when I really start to examine why I'm doing things, why am I putting in the phone call, why am I giving that money or whatever it is, my motives lack the purity of intent. And you know, years ago, there was a book called Philokelia, and um, they talked in that book, it, uh, it, I don't even know when it was published, but uh, in that book they talked about sobriety, and what they meant by that was purity of heart, purity of decision-making, purity of motives. And I really have 
learned a whole lot from that. So that brings me then to step 11. And to talk about step 11, if you're sitting out there and, and you're thinking you don't have a prayer practice and you don't meditate and so on, join the club. Not now, but for years. I'll explain. When I was a little girl, uh, I was born in Saskatchewan, just as you pronounced it yesterday, uh, my friend. And um, we were Roman Catholic, and there were ten of us in the, in the family. Church was a part of the fabric of our existence. Maybe it was the whole fabric. Going to church was part of the way we did things. There was ritual, there was dogma, and there were requirements. And it was assumed. We lived in this, knew everybody in this 20 square mile area, and it was assumed that you'd be at church on Sunday, and that you prayed and that you did the requirements and so on. Nobody questioned that. I was okay with that. That's how I was raised. And then at about three, something happened. <laughs> I don't know how the chron chronology of that works, but I know that about three, because I've checked this out with my brothers, at about three, somebody started crawling into my bed. And she was crying. My sister, Dora, and if you know me, I've, you've heard me talk about this. Dora was injured at birth. She couldn't study as quickly as the other kids that kept her in grade three till she was 16. The kids made fun of her, and she cried at night. And she'd crawl into bed with me, and I'd cry with her. And I made it my business that this had to stop, that she had to get fixed. Somebody had to fix it. I went to this family that I was sure loved me, and they didn't fix it. And I thought they didn't because they were hard-hearted. Not true. They didn't fix it because they couldn't. And then I went to God. I was not raised in a church where people said that God was mean. I was raised, I heard, I think, the priests say, that God was love and power. Well, those great qualities, here I am, God. Fix this problem for me. And nothing happened. And I remember sitting on the woodpile. I started to drink when I was five. I remember sitting on the woodpile with my cup of homebrew, thinking about God, looking at the sunsets, looking at the aurora borealis at night, looking at the stars in the sky, and saying, God, how is this? You make this? And you can't fix my sister? What's wrong with you? How does this work? I didn't turn against God because, I don't know, maybe I'm an old soul. I'm a God seeker. I was even as a little girl. Somehow or other, I felt that the answers would come from God. God as I understood God. I said at five I took a drink. I was an alcoholic from the word from the first drink. I'm not going to regale you and take the time to recount how I got to a park bench. You have heard this from speaker after speaker, but I can tell you in 35 years, that's where I was. I didn't have five cents to my name. I didn't have a friend in the world. I was selling my body living on a park bench. That's where my experience of drinking, I needed to drink because that's the only time I felt okay. I was a smart kid, but I didn't fit. And so the only time I felt okay was when I had booze in me. And when you're five and six and seven, on a farm, you drink different than you do when you're 25 in the city. But nevertheless, you get the job done. I lied, I cheated, I stole, I did everything I could to get that booze into me as often as I could. My parents sent me to a finishing school, a convent. And um, 
very, I was there for four years, and I finished my schooling at, I was 14 and a half. Well, what do you do with a 14 and a half year old? Number one, my, I wanted to be a lawyer. I realize this now. I didn't go partly because of age, but partly because I was afraid. I was afraid of life. You know, this program has given me so much, and it's taken some of that fear of the world away. You know, if you think that people aren't going to help you, I had proof. Dora was crying. You didn't do anything about it. How can, what's wrong with the world? I'm going to go to the big city, and if I get a problem, who's going to help me? John wasn't around in those days. <laughs> so I, I hung around. I got a little job. And for the next three years, uh, I pretty much partied in this town where we lived. And then one day, one day I was at an event, and one of the girls said, um, I'm going to join the convent. Hmm. And as a joke, as a joke, I said, me too. And they just laughed. And I thought, I'll show you. <laughs> so I went to this convent finishing school to say, I, I thought I, you know, I, crazy. They laughed at me. They said I didn't belong there. Well, there was another convent in my hometown, and you tell me I can't do something? And now it was becoming big stuff. I went to the second convent, and they said, no, they wouldn't take me. And I went to our pastor, and I said, what is wrong? I said, I thought they would like to have people like me in the convent, and he laughed. That did it. I knew there were convents and that were swinging convents. <laughs> and I knew where they were in the United States. Doesn't everything swing in the United States? So finally, I got a letter back from a convent in Baltimore, and they said, we have a convent in Waterdown. And so I wrote to them, and sight unseen, they invited me to come and join the convent. Nowadays, if you tried to get into a convent or a monastery, you would do so many psychological tests to avoid getting the likes of me in there. In the, that, that night, I was drunk the night I entered. They took me, and uh, for the next 15 years, that's what I did. Uh, I worked hard, went to university, taught school, played the organ, did all kinds of great things. And in those 15 years, you know, and when you are in an environment where nobody is drinking, and you're drinking, pretty obvious, I would think. But it's also something when you function, people kind of see things different. And I functioned too much sometimes, but I functioned. And so nobody in those 15 years ever said anything to me. And um, we got a new mother superior who was really enlightened. And one day she called me and she said, Sister, I think you're not happy here. And she said, would you like to leave? And I said, yeah, I'd like to leave, but you have to understand, in those days we were told there was a heaven and a hell, and that if you were allowed to take vows and you left, you were endangering your immortal soul. Now, I'm sure some of your eyes are glazing over at that, but that was a big deal for me because... I didn't know what to make of all that. Anyway, eventually we wrote to Rome. I got my dispensation January the 10th, 1966. I'm standing on the convent steps, and everything's good. I'm okay. And uh, I know that some man is going to find me, and we're going to be okay. I no longer had the vows. I had trampled on them a little anyway from time to time. Uh, <laughs> I had lied and cheated and stolen, done everything that I needed to do to stay appropriately drunk or stoned. And, um, you know, I remember thinking, it's going to be okay now. I've got my secular name back. I'm no longer Sister Mary Eugenia, and I've got my secular clothes. I thought it was as simple as fixing and changing the outside. 
I was a well-educated young woman, and I didn't have a clue that the problem was right in here. And you can fix the outside. You can make it look like whatever you think it should look like, and nothing has changed. Within two days, I found the bars. I loved the bars. I loved the booze in the bars. And I loved the men in the bars. And the men in the bars loved me. And I have to tell you that I spent ten months in the darkest, most ugly place. I always say it was ten months of darkness and debauchery. And I, at the end of that time, I just... I, I couldn't stand myself, so I signed myself into an insane asylum. And somebody had told me about a psychiatrist who was there, so I signed myself in. My family had a private detective find me, and they took me to Saskatoon, which is where I was to meet Dr. Abraham Hoffer. I was in the university hospital for six weeks, and one day I was called to Dr. McCarricker's office, and Dr. Hoffer was sitting there. And he had my file. By this time, I had been locked up in psych wards 32 times. I had had 38 electroshock treatments, and that will light up your life appropriately, I can tell you. <laughs> they used to put me in cold water baths. They used to tie me to the bed when necessary, and it wasn't for fun and frolic, believe me. And... Um, I'd had hundreds of hours of therapy, but the therapy was always about you, how you had made life difficult for me. Anyway, Dr. Hoffer looked at this and he said, he said, I know people who I think have the same problem that you do. He said, I don't think you have all these psychiatric illnesses. He said, you're alcoholic and you should go to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, in that office at the time was sitting Dr. McCarricker, who was the chief of staff, and he said, oh, Abe, he said, we can't let her go to AA. It would interfere with her program, with her treatment. Abe won out, and I went to AA. I don't know nothing from nothing. See, I have a brother who died 49 years sober, and I remember when he got sober, and I remember what my dad said about AA. He said, it's good. And he cried. He said, Our, he said, my son no longer drinks. And he said, he has been transformed. Now, from my dad, that was about as good as it got. Transformed? I want some of that. But I didn't know. You see... Up to this point, I had lived my life on the outside. I knew nothing, really, despite all that fancy therapy about how I truly function. And despite the fact that I'd been in a convent, the only things I knew were the things I'd studied in theology. I could tell you all kinds of fancy things about the Trinity, and I could explain the transubstantiation to you, and I could tell you all kinds of things. I had nothing going on in my heart, and I had no feeling or no sense of a relationship with God. And so uh, I went to, went to AA, and I didn't know that there was something I was going to have to do, my dad said it was good, so I'll park myself. I parked myself for three weeks, and nobody had transformed me. I didn't feel good, and I know how to feel good, so I got stoned. And I'm not going to drink because my dad said this is a good place. Five and a half years I sat here. That's when I met the likes of Wes Parrish, Mac Cheater, Chuck Chamberlain. Chuck used to sit with me. Time after time, he'd come to Prince Albert, and he'd sit with me, and he'd talk to me. And I remember that little diagram of the circle, there is only one. And then he'd draw that, and he'd say, you think you are different, you think you're separate, and so on and so on. And, you know, I'm sure he saw my eyes glaze over. Three weeks went by, and I helped myself to 
what um, Mari so charmingly calls yum-yums. And I also liked the Jolly Jumpers, which were my favorite. And uh, so I sat in AA stoned for that five and a half years. And one more time, I'm the loser. I left AA. I thought, you know, this nothing works for me. Nothing works for me. I am the loser. And within a day, I was drunk. I jumped out of a two-story window, broke my feet. And from there, it just gets worse. Six convulsions later, DTs. I couldn't stop. I had nothing to stop for as I saw it. I didn't know how to live sober. I had never accomplished it. And despite all my fancy education and despite all my accomplishments, I went to a park bench. I should tell you I had married my psychiatrist. Not Dr. Hoffer, by the way. I married another guy. And he, too, was alcoholic. And uh, he started to drink, and I started to drink, and we lost everything. And when I say we lost everything, I mean exactly that. So we split, and I wound up on the park bench, and the police picked me up on May the 18th, 1973, and they took me to a psych ward. And I couldn't move. I used to get paralysis. The morning of the 20th, The nurse took me to the washroom, and I saw myself. Teeth knocked out. I weighed about 85 pounds, and uh, hair straggly, and a mess. And I said to her, I've become a woman of the streets, haven't I? And she said, yes, you have. Just think of that. I come from a family that was as decent as they come a family where people valued integrity. They valued keeping their word. They were decent, wonderful people. And there, the baby of the family is out on a park bench. Wonderful. On top of it, an ex-nun. See, I believe you, Mari, said that the other day, that you used to think that it was just alcohol, and then you realized I believe, too, alcohol or not, my life would have been a disaster because of the kind of person I was. I would step over you. I was an angry person. I would use you. I would try to control you, manipulate you, and I could go on and on. So she took me back to my room after breakfast, and uh, I thought, what am I going to do? I was so broken at that time. I remember trying to read something. I couldn't read two lines and know what I had read. And uh, I thought, nobody wants me. My family would let me come home, but they, they won't let me drink. My mother was kind of ticked off one day when I came home with the family banker at 7 o'clock in the morning who was very much married with little children. And so that wasn't going to work. I couldn't think of one person on the planet who would let me in, who would give me anything, and I was sick of asking. I was done. So I made up my mind what I was going to do, and that was take my life. And I had been in enough psych wards, I knew exactly how to do it. And so I called the nurse, and I asked her to get my clothes. And um, as she she went to get them, I thought, half an hour, and it's over. And I don't care what's on the other side. It's done. I'm out of this. And uh, she went to get my clothes. Did I pray? No. Why would I pray? God never did anything for me. That was my attitude. So there. And um, call AA, they never did anything for me. There's nothing. So she went to get my clothes. What I'm saying is, I think that I said the most profound, or I had the most profound experience with God that morning 
because I think the most profound way of relating to God is to say, I'm done. I don't know how to do this. God's not without power. God's not without knowing how. But as long as my fists are clenched and saying, it's got to go my way, you've got to make me sober. You've got to fix Dory. You've got to, got to, got to, got to. Universe says, go your way until you can get to that point. I didn't know that that morning. And so that's where I was. I'm done. And as she went to get my clothes, an unbelievable thing happened to me. And this I want, I will tell you in some detail. I was standing there, and it was as if a hand reached into me and took the compulsion to drink. I was 40 years old. I had been drinking in a very dedicated fashion for 35 years. And I stood there absolutely stunned because I remember thinking, it's finished. I don't have to drink anymore. I don't have to drink anymore. I knew that as clearly as I see you. And I remember saying, because it was such an experience, I remember saying, I don't know how to live sober. Whoever you are, whatever this is, you'll have to send me somebody. And if you do, I'll obey. And by God, there was a rap on the door. And a man stood there, and he really was there. (laughs) And he said, I came to offer you some help. He said, are you alcoholic? And I said, yeah, you want to make something of it? Kind, kind man. I've told this story hundreds of times. I still hope that one day somebody will step up and say, I was that man. He he said, you know, if you're alcoholic, he said, I'm not alcoholic. But he said, there's a hospital. In 1973, there were no treatment centers. Or they were kind of toying with something, but not really. And Dr. Bell had established this hospital kind of treatment center. And uh, he said, I'll take you there tomorrow if you'll go. And he took me out of the kindness of his heart. Nurse talked to me, said, you need treatment. You have no money, can't keep you. I'm crying as I'm leaving. And I hear this big voice say, keep that woman here. Give her a bed now. And it was Dr. Bell himself. And so I stayed there for 28 days and um, went to Skid Row from there. I lived on Skid Row for a year. Isn't it nice that I can say I can go to Caesar's Palace to my favorite shop and buy a new suit if I so wish? That's not the essence of recovery, but I like to know that nice things have happened. That day I didn't, I did, all I could afford was what they gave me a little money and i lived on skid row and there was a psychiatrist at the at the institution and he said get a job and what i did was i went down young street and i went down dundas and i pounded on doors and i said i need i need to work can you give me something to do i'll wash dishes i'll do anything i had to be broken I had to be broken open, and I just did what I was told. And after a day and a half, a man said, I've got a factory, and if you'll come, he said, and sweep the floor every day, he said, I'll give you a little money, and that's how I lived the first year. I was hungry some of the time, didn't have enough money to buy food. I didn't know about welfare, and I was raised in a family that said, You make your bed, you lie in it. I made this mess, I'll get out of it. Wasn't going to AA, not to that stupid organization. And um, so I'd go back to my... How I survived, I you know, that's a grace in itself. Six months go by, and I'm at the institution one day, and a man asked me to a meeting. I didn't know what it was. 
I wasn't getting many invitations, so I went with him. And it was a meeting of AA. And I don't know what happened there. But what I do remember is this. People were smiling. They seemed to be standing in groups. They were talking to each other. They were planning to go to lunch and things like that. And there was, uh, there I was. And the amazing thing was they said, keep coming back. And I remember thinking, why do they want me to come back? But I did go back and I fell in love. And that has been my saving grace through all the days of kind of shutting God out, through all the days of self-sufficiency where I didn't think I needed this and I needed that. I got in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. My first sponsor got drunk, and then I got one with a size 15 shoe, and I hope Larry isn't here. (laughs) He didn't hesitate to apply it to my backside. He didn't care how I felt. He said, you want to get well, I'll give you, I'll give you the pattern. We'll do it together. And he said, if you don't want to follow instructions, don't call me again. Get another sponsor. And so this man now is 55 years sober. In September, we just celebrated his 55 years. And we celebrated three weeks ago his 65 years being married to the same woman. And He knew how to live. He knew how to live, and he knew how to deal with me, and he put up with nothing from me. And so I got to pay off the debts, and I'm going to go over this quickly because I want to get to being 20 years sober. And um, at seven years, I had paid off the debts and um, had no money, had a rusty old car, was sponsoring a lot of people, and the people at the group used to call it my sponsor mobile. They'd all, all my sponsees pile out of this rusty car. Interestingly, they all got drunk. I stayed sober. I did the best I could, you know, with what I had at the time. And uh, anyway, I don't get anybody sober, so that's nothing to worry about. Um, Seven years, and by a God shot, I bought a house, and it was shown to me how I could do that, and I was to buy many houses in the next 12 years. The reason I'm saying that is not so you say, oh, well, isn't that wonderful? That wasn't the point. It's all about lessons. There was a piece of me that said, if I can make money, people are going to love me. I'm going to make this big house I'm going to get my own big house, and then everybody's going to come there like Bob does now, have have people come to his house, and I'm going to be somebody, because deep in my heart, I felt I was nobody. And so the bank account grew, but the feelings I had about myself didn't. I'm busy in AA. This is the interesting thing. If you had been near me at the time, if you had seen what was going on in my life, you would have said, she's got it all. Doing good. And I was starting to die inside. And at 18 years, an older member took me through the steps, and I really started to unravel. At 20, I gave up the man that had been in my life. I gave up my job. And I went into a real depression. You know, Tom Ivester was so right, I believe. I don't know how to run my life. I do have to make the decisions, absolutely. And if they are the right things, then some kinds of things happen. But if they're not the right things, uh, then some... They go up in smoke. This business of making money, I think I grew up. I think it was part of maturing, learning how to live and be responsible and 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 all that. But one day I found myself sitting on my fine sofa 
with my red convertible in the driveway, and I was crying my eyes out because I thought, this isn't it either. What do I do now? And uh, somebody pointed me to a, pace, a passage in Step 8 in the, in the 12 and 12, where Bill writes about stuff that had been buried since childhood, and I'm not talking about the inner child, please. He talks about the old ideas, the bondage of self that we carry, those old ideas. And, you know, it's amazing. I've always found this, that when I'm ready, the teacher appears. The person, I was at a conference, and a man was there, and he talked about his old ideas and how his old ideas had kept him from success, and he didn't even know what the problem was. And he worked with me, and I learned how to deal with those, and I changed, And but I was still in that place. I don't have a job now. I didn't hadn't really planned for the future, and I was depressed. And one day, the phone rang, and it was Father O'Brien, who's a Jesuit priest in charge of the, mon- of the uh, Jesuit house in Toronto. And he said, Mildred, you don't know me. He said, I know you. I know about you. And he said, I'd like you to come and give a retreat. I said, a retreat? I'd never given a retreat. I had never even thought about that. That's where this stuff gets really spooky. Can I use that word, Jay? And um, I said, you don't know how many times I've been excommunicated. And he said, I don't care about that. So I went out, and I gave this retreat to 70 women. You know, I'm 20 years sober at this time, and I'm still not crazy about women, but I can tolerate them. But I'll tell you one thing. I don't cry in front of women. I reserve that for men. (laughs) A strategic tear works wonders with a man. I finished that retreat that Sunday morning, and uh, I'm on the, doing the last conference, standing in front of those 70 women. And I had an experience that I believe is as significant as the experience of May the 20th, 1973. I stood there in front of those women, and I started to bawl. I didn't cry pretty like they do in the movies when their makeup doesn't run and, you know, their face doesn't get... I bawled. And I said, and I hadn't planned this, where does this come from? You know and I know. I said to those women, I am the loneliest person in the world. I have lots of acquaintances, and I don't have one friend. And that was the truth. That little girl who felt so hurt by the fact that her brothers and sisters didn't fix Dora, put up walls. Put up walls against all those people who hadn't loved me. All those people who didn't do it the way I needed you to do it. Those walls were thick. And as I said that, I I haven't got the words. I can just say it as best I can. It was as if it felt like whoosh, and all those walls were gone. And I remember standing there thinking, I don't know how to live like this. It's like being a chicken without feathers. What do you do? See, I had always presented an image, a face, a way I wanted you to see me. And you wouldn't get past that, I guarantee you. If I didn't want you to see something else, I'd shut down. And you knew that I had shut down. And people would say, you know, you intimidate me. I was sick enough to think that was a compliment. 
what they were saying was, I can't deal with you. You won't let me in. I didn't know what all that meant. And I was 60 years old at the time, and I was 20 years sober. See, I don't care where you're at. You are the only place you can be. You know, people can't grow you. I believe that God grows our souls. Just the way God grows, we plant the seed and we water it, but we don't grow a carrot. That life force is within that seed. And it's the life force that shows up in the form of whatever. And I'm not going to apologize. I, like I, I, sometimes I've thought, I wonder what people are going to think of that. Well, whatever you think is your business. I just know that I did the best I could. And I think that, like Sandy said, we're here to grow in conscious contact with God. And that's the process. And in the process, everything that stands between me and God has to go. And, you know, sometimes when I've talked about this, people say to me, can you help me get rid of my walls? Not a chance. Not a chance. Because if you've got walls, they're there for a purpose. And if somebody tries to muck around with those walls, you've got to live without those walls. I was ready. And when those walls came down and I stood there defenseless, that was a God deal. And those women gathered round and said, you know, we'll, you know, we'll meet for coffee and so on. And my life changed. That's when I began the process. See, it always feels to me as if from, from get, from May the 20th, 1973 to this day, and I don't know what date this was, that was a process of, of Growing up, maturing, learning how to do some things, developing some good habits. And now I was ready for the next piece. And that's exactly what it was. Because as I started to relate to you in a truthful, honest, open way, I found out something about you. I found God through that process, God in you, but I also found God in me. And that's where the, this next phase of my growth started. Because I think that is really what, what it is all about. And that's when I knew I had to meditate. Now, don't go off into cuckoo land and think, oh, we're going to talk about, you know, meditating and singing OM all day. I don't think that's what it's about. I think that I'll trust Bill when he says here in the 12 and 12 that prayer and meditation are the principal means of conscious contact with God. Sure, I've got to go and do, I've got to be busy. But I think I need to grow in awareness and uh, with the God of my being. I didn't know any of that. I was always busy, 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 running, 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 doing, doing, doing. And the more I could do and the more I could get, that's what I thought the deal was about. And I don't believe that now. You know, one of the ministers that I went to see at one time, he talked about it like this. He took two candles, and one had a wick, and one had no wick, and they were the same size candles. And he said, now watch this. He said, both have the same capacity, the same amount of wax, so they have the same amount of burning possibility. And he took a light, and he lit the one with the wick. And he said, then he said, what am I going to do with this one now? Can this one also give light? Obviously, it had no wick. He said, that's why you need to meditate. You need a wick. And the wick 
that you develop is through your relationship with God. Pascal, one of the great French philosophers, put it this way. He said, God's voice is the voice of silence. And in the Bible, it says, be still. It doesn't say be quiet. It's still. Still is much more profound than quiet. Be still and know that I am God. I can't tell you. I just knew that there was more, and this was how I got to it. And I knew that I had to meditate. And I started. I got a teacher, and I started the process, and I've never stopped. And right now, if you want to know, because sometimes people say, well, how much do you meditate? Well, I meditate a half hour in the morning, and I meditate a half hour at night, at least and sometimes during the day. And that doesn't take away from my efficiency. Actually, it adds to my efficiency. It gives me a a quieter mind. Even though I did that stupid thing on the walkway the other day, (laughs) generally, I'm much more observant about things. And um, people in Toronto will comment on this often. They say, Mildred, you have changed so much. You used to be so hard. You used to be so difficult, even though you were kind. See, I lived up here, and I knew how to act as if I cared. I knew how to act kind. I knew how to act compassionate. I knew the words to say, but there was no wick in the candle. The wick in the candle is when I can take a look at you and know, you're in earth school just like I am. This body isn't what it's about. It's the spirit. Another one of my teachers, God God, has sent me some wonderful people, and he talked about the block of mahogany. And he said if we have a block of mahogany, and we take that and we carve a figure out of that, he said, do we have mahogany and a figure? Or do we have mahogany in the form of a figure? Well, obviously, we have mahogany in the form of a figure, right? He said, you know, your book says if God is either God is everything or God is nothing. And if God is everything, then what are you made of? What is your spirit made of? See, I, I think that I need to take, be vigilant about where I put things, where I become unkind, or where I do things that are not godlike. But I find that I am much healthier through remembering who I am rather than the crap I do. You know, because what you focus on grows. You keep on focusing on, I'm so mean, I'm so nasty. It just grows. I can tell you that when I remember, I believe today that God lives within me, that God is my life. And that if that is the case, it's shut my mouth many a time. Because that's not the right way to be speaking. That's not the right way to be acting. And I think that's the change that will, that, that's the difference that will make the world. Look what Bill Wilson said. I too go to stepping stones. They don't give me the stuff they give you, Jay, but they do give me some nice stuff. And one of the things Bill wrote in 1956, February the 16th, we certain, this was 1956. I wonder what he'd say today. We certainly live in a distraught world. But we of AA do not find this too disturbing. We ourselves got better only by first getting much worse. So maybe that is the way it is going to be the way of it for the modern world. Maybe it has to get much worse. 
And I know there are spiritual teachers who say that we are in for a change. And I think if there's anything, if there's any organization that has, will contribute. You know, the love in this room is, is unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, as I've been here, I've just looked around and, you know, experienced the kindness and all of that. Dr. David Hawkins, who's an American, he says he believes, and he's not a member of AA, he says he believes that Alcoholics Anonymous has influenced 50% of the population in North America. That's pretty powerful. I was at an anniversary meeting about two weeks ago, and they have the meeting in the basement. And they invited the minister of the church to come and bring greetings. And he got to the front and he said, don't ever tell my congregation I said this. But he said, I just wish that more of what you people do down here got done upstairs. <laughs> I mean, I think that's, that's really a tribute. So, My, my life, I don't pray a great deal. I sit in the silence a lot. I don't know what to pray for. Teilhard de Chardin, the great Jesuit, he said, once you know that God is within, he said, who are you going to pray to? Just get right with it and behave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to tell you two more things. You know, uh, I love the way I live now. I love to know that I can, I can brighten somebody's day. So instead of just going and giving the cashier my credit card, I like to think before I go. That's a God being there. You're there, God. And say to her, how are you doing today? the day getting long, and often you just see the face just, just light up. And the world in that place is just a little lighter because I've taken the time. And I, please, don't, I've been such a jerk most of my life. I just love acting like this now. And, <laughs> you know, I, I, I used to just kind of look at people and think, I don't know them. It wasn't I didn't like you. Yeah, I did not like you a lot. <laughs> but that has changed. I used to even sit at the meetings. We have a slogan at the meetings. It says, um, I'm, we are no longer alone. And I hear people come in and they say, you know, I just knew the first time I came into the meeting, I'm no longer alone. I think, well, bully for you. I've been here 20 years, and I still feel alone. But I'm starting to feel a little different about that. I've got some amends to make. You know, I slighted my family. I didn't love them. I didn't appreciate them. And, you know, seven of my brothers and sisters are dead now. And uh, so I'm in the process of making amends by getting to know my nieces and nephews. I've got 35 of them. And I've been reaching out to them, and you know what? They've been reaching back. They're really happy to get to know their Aunt Milton. Great life. I'm a different person in AA, too. And um, another little thing that I have here from Bill, he says this. He wrote this to a sim in a sympathy letter. I won't read the whole thing, just a, a statement. I am glad Bill was nuts. <laughs> I'm glad that he wrote that article on emotional sobriety. You know where he says he couldn't find peace, he couldn't find happiness, and he realized it was his dependence on people, places, and things. And in this article to this woman, and again, this was 1956. I'll just read you a sentence or two. Some people think God made life just for happiness. But I find myself unable to share that view. 
I think he made life for growth and that he permits pain as the touchstone of it all. Happiness, at the very least satisfaction, is a byproduct of really trying to grow, and seasons of real joy are occasional byproducts of the process. I'm not recommending being cranky or being unhappy, but I also know, I think one of my students from Florida wrote me an email recently, and she said, I'm having trouble living in a three-dimensional world with fourth-dimensional truth. Me too. <laughs> Big job, eh? This business of living on the earth school, it's, it's a challenge. I need you. That's why I'm here. And I'll be here till the, the day I die. And I'm going to close with a story. I love paradox. I love metaphors. I love pictures. I love all that stuff. And somebody put into my hands a book called Tales of the Magic Mountain by Theophane the Monk. And it's filled with stories that you say to yourself, what the hell is he talking about? This man went to the monastery, and he said to the head monk, I want to be a monk. And the, the head monk said, what kind of monk do you want to be? He said, I want to be a real monk. And so the head monk took a glass of red wine and he gave it to him to drink. And he drank it. And as he did, a crystal globe formed over the monk. And he, all he could see, this ordinary person that he had seen before, now looked indescribably beautiful. And he said to himself, I wonder if he knows how beautiful he really is. Maybe I should tell him. And as he tried, he realized that in the drinking of the red wine, his tongue had been burned out. And he said to himself, Oh, well, I have the memory of what just occurred. And as he went his way, he realized that as he chose to look in through that crystal globe, anybody that approached and came into that crystal globe, obviously meaning his willingness to see the divine presence in them, he saw them as so incredibly beautiful. And he knew that it was real. If nobody has told you today, if nobody has put you in the golden globe or the crystal globe and told you that you are incredibly beautiful, I'm telling you now, you are incredibly beautiful. And my heart is open to you. And I thank you for your kind attention. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.